And sales, we're starting to hear a lot about math. And the math that we should be focused on is who's making the most amount of money, who's having the most amount of success. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Price is law. I've mentioned this in a couple of episodes before and on YouTube and LinkedIn. Price's Law states that the square root of the number, in this case, of salespeople, so if you have nine salespeople, the square root of nine is three, will generate 50% of the revenue. So this is taking the normal distribution curve and recursively building it out. So we're going to use a little bit of math in this episode, but I hope to not to overwhelm you. But the importance of this is critical as a sales rep in several perspectives. Why? Because you want to be one of those three, one of those price salespeople, meaning that you are generating the 50% of the revenue and getting uh, a lot of the commission. And you can do the math here. And there's a calculator that I'll probably put up on LinkedIn somewhere or, or distribute it somehow. But the, the math is pretty simple. I mean, you get a square root. I think we all can figure that out. But why is this important? Because managers are going to start to learn this. Because this has been my mission probably for about a year and a half is to educate managers not to mandate mediocrity. Because what do managers do? They take those square root, those price salespeople, the ones generating 50% of the revenue, and they divide their territory up among the rest, the B players and the C players. And they discourage the A players that are generating 50% of the revenue. Guess what happens? The A players leave because they, they got people calling them night and day. They have ex-managers and ex-employees going, oh, man, that person's great. Have them come over here. This is causing an enormous problem in sales, and it's been going on for a long time. But we've got to get management away from the normal distribution curve and mandated mediocrity, focusing on the quality, not the quantity. The quantity doesn't matter. The 3x the pipeline, it's fictitious. It's gaming the system. Now, we're going to get into Goodhart's Law in this as well. And I've had a lot of managers, they'll argue this to death, that the problem is you cannot fight nature. You can't. You can try. You can try and fight gravity, but you're always going to get smashed. You can either play with it or get killed by it. So we'll sum up this at the end, and I'll, I'll give you an update on the courses. <coughs> Excuse me. Also... Are you checking out CoVideo? Uh, I've got some episodes coming up on uh, influence and persuasion and clearly image and video and seeing the person has such an enormous impact on that. And the way to do it is through video email today, CoVideo. That's the way to do it. That's how I do it. And it's blown up my business this year. Uh, I probably had a, a five or six X already, and here it is not even over yet, because I've leveraged video, brevity, humor to tell the story of the problem I solve. It takes a little creativity, I get it, but the video itself doesn't, but it requires us to believe and see that we are performers. Sales is not a know it or don't know it profession. The knowing it is the easy part. Being able to perform it is the hard part. And if you don't believe that, uh, look around. Okay, here we go. Here's the interview. Hey, this is also going to be up on YouTube if you'd rather watch the video of it and get to see my pretty face. Here we go. Hey, Dana, welcome back to the show. Give us a little update on yourself. Thanks, Brian. Uh, well, since the last time we talked, uh, I was at Serious Decisions. I was an analyst there for a few years. And uh, I had an opportunity to get closer to salespeople to help them sell. I joined Anna Plan a couple of weeks ago, and now I'm, I'm uh, adjacent to their sales organization, really helping some of their top performers sell into their largest accounts and their largest opportunities. So delighted to be back in, in the sales realm and, and being closer to customers. Cool. Hey, we had uh, reconnected a couple months ago. I did a video on Price's Law, and then you shared a blog post that you had written about Price's Law. So it was kind of... Uh, uh, ironic that we, we, we both had the same perspective. How did you learn about it? I, I just learned about it. I, I think it was a YouTube video that I saw and I, and I saw a social scientist that was, that was talking about it. 
and, and really started to drive home the fact that there was a guy named Derek DeSola Price who studied his um, his graduate students and, and noticed that some of them were producing a lot more content than others. Uh, so he took it down to another level and, and determined that the, the square root of the number of individuals involved in any endeavor produced 50% of the work. And I noticed it as I, as I talked to clients when I was an analyst and, and talking to the productivity of their own sales organizations. And what I experienced in my own life was that there are a certain number of really productive salespeople. And I always thought it followed the 80-20 rule where 20% of the organization was producing 80% of the results. But it, it's, it's even worse than that. So the, the square root of the number of 100, for instance, is, is 10. So if you've got a sales organization of, of 10 people, that means that, I'm sorry, of 100 people, that means that probably 10 of them are producing 50% of the results. So I just started to, to, to look at this and ask clients questions about the number of, of highly productive people, and it really followed that, that law. And that brings up several things, because what I've seen most often is managers trying to level it off, trying to beat the law by readjusting quotas and territories, and, and all of a sudden what happens, that 10%, leaves. That's a, that's a really good point. And, you know, and you're reminding me of some things that I've seen where I've, I've seen certain sales managers who try to manage their portfolio of quota, like a mutual fund. Yeah. So they're trying <laughs> to spread the risk among all of their salespeople. They don't want anyone to overperform too much and they don't want anyone to underperform. So they're really raising up their lowest performers through quota manipulation yes. and discouraging their highest performers by taking opportunity away from them. And it, it does happen uh, quite often. And, and that's when you see somebody come in and readjust the compensation plan and say, we've got a pay for performance plan now, and we're going to reward our top performers. Yeah, that happened to me firsthand. My, one of my first sales jobs, I had blown it away, had a great year. You know, some of it was timing and luck. And of course, there was all the traditional hard work and stuff, but I was doing 30% of the company's number. And the reaction that I got from the CEO was, hey, you're playing at a whole nother level. The reaction I got from my boss's boss was, hey, you're making me look bad. I go, I'm making you look bad? <laughs> <laughs> How do I make you look better? <laughs> you know, that's, a, that. that's a weak manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and ironically, when he became a CEO, the company went under. But how do managers leverage this law? And you first be aware of it, and then instead of trying to fight it, work with it because it's a law of nature. It's not something that they can fix. It's like gravity. It's, it's something you can't do anything about. But what, what I notice is that the, one of the instincts of a manager is to say that I've got a certain number of top performing people, my A players, and I'm going to try to make all my Bs and Cs A players. Yeah. And it, it, it's counterintuitive to say that maybe you shouldn't be trying to do that. Maybe you should just be trying to take care of those A players as much as you possibly can. Uh, support them, give them the freedom that they need to do their jobs. With the, with the B players, there, there's some B players out there who will definitely be the A players and get given enough time. But C players rarely become A players. Yeah. But the, the Bs and the, and the Cs are pr performing something pretty important to the company to, to a certain degree because they're taking care of the other 50% of the work. Yeah. If, if you get rid of all the Bs and all the Cs, then your, your A's are just going to get completely overwhelmed. They, they, they won't have enough capacity to do what you're asking them to do. And then you'll end up driving them out the door. So it's, it, it, it's sort of a, a counterintuitive to say, if I get rid of all my B's and C's, then, then my A's will do better. If you get rid of too many B's and C's, you're going to put too much pressure on your A's. And your A's have the, the greatest opportunity to leave. They do, so try, because try, everybody try wants them. Yeah. yeah. And why is this so different in sales than it is like in engineering? Because I, I was in engineering before I got into sales. And, and there was always those one or two engineers. They, they designed the product. They got up prototypes. And all we did was implement their thoughts and ideas several different ways and just grind it out. Now, well, those that, they got all the equity, right? They got all the reward. And, and the, they, the, 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 the law exists in any kind of endeavor. So the engineers, they have their top performers as well. But sales is easiest to pick on because they, they are measured to death inside of an organization. And it's pretty easy to identify your top performers versus your, your, your low performers. But as, as a sales operations leader, I, I've got some guilt over this thing because we're the ones that set the quota. And, and quota setting is an art. It's not a science. And I can tell you personally that I've made mistakes in my career and set the wrong quotas for people. So you can take an A player and turn them into a C player pretty quickly just by, by making mistakes for their quotas. 
Yeah. And similarly, you can take a C player and make them look like an A player because you've given them way too low of a quarter with too rich of a, a territory. So the, playing by the numbers is, is kind of a difficult thing to do when you're thinking about prices law. You have to take some sort of a, a personal approach to managing performance, and you know who those people are. And the numbers don't always reflect who they are. And don't you think we've gone backwards or we've gone too far on the spectrum between you know, managing people to try and managing robots or resources? What I hear today, everyone's called a resource. And it's like, no, they're human beings with different talents and skills, and their performance is gonna be variable. They're not robots. Yeah, they, not everyone can have a great day every single day. Not everyone can have a great quarter every single quarter. I, I just wrote a blog, it went out about a month ago. It's called uh, 2,112 uh, Things You Should Know About Artificial Intelligence. And it, it's a play on a song by, by a band called Rush called the, uh, the Temples of Syrinx or the priest of the temple of Syrinx. And they, they talk about a world in which everything will be measured to the nth degree. And the, the purveyors of that information will be in control of everything. And what, what I see happening with artificial intelligence, especially around salespeople, is that every action that they take, every keystroke that they take, every conversation that they have is being recorded. It's being analyzed. It's being um, analyzed for, to, to, to understand who the best performers are. What, what they're doing and how they're doing it. So literally sales productivity is being measured on a keystroke by keystroke basis. And I believe where I see this technology going is that all that information is going to be contained in some repository. It's already contained inside of companies today. Yeah. But there, there, are, there are companies out there that are recording this information, like your quota performance at every company that you've ever been at. So th this, this information, the, the number of calls you've made, the conversations, the, the activity that you've been involved in, your quota attainment, is going to get recorded in a central database and, and shared among other companies. And it'll follow you in your career like a credit score. And I think it's looking at it the wrong way because what other profession can you do that at? Because sales is, is and always will be a performance profession because yeah. we're selling to people. We're not selling to an algorithm and the people we sell to are all very different. You wouldn't have KPIs or, uh, any of this with psychoanalysis or parenting? You ever try and give your kids KPIs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, there, there is another profession where it's done to this degree, and it's been done this way for a long time, is professional sports. I, to a certain extent, right? Because then you get the, the money ball thing. But that was more about putting a team together as opposed to becoming a better pitcher or better catcher or better first base. Well, yeah, but they, they were looking for the, the hidden attributes of a top performer, yeah. but the, the, uh, of a baseball player, especially their stats follow them for their entire career. And I, I believe that's eventually what's going to happen to salespeople. And it's not going to, the way it's going to happen, I think but, it's going to happen. But, but the stats are on the results, not on the pre, prelude to the results. That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But I, it, I can see top performing salespeople asking for this information and, and, you know, there'll be a change in the law where that information will be belong to the employee, not necessarily just to the, to the customer. I mean, to the, yeah, to the because company. I, I see it on the wrong things, meaning like yeah. when you go for a job interview, I'm looking for, okay, uh, what was your quota? What was your attainment? Yeah. Tell me about your top three biggest deals. Tell me about a deal that you got into that it wasn't an inbound. Tell me about a deal that you bought, you beat your competitor at. Okay. Yeah. Those, those are all great data sources, but they're performance results oriented. You know how much I care about how many calls you made a day? I, I, I totally agree with you. I'm just telling you where I think it's going. We're, we're, we're getting, oh, I, I, yeah. We're, and I think it's, it, it's yeah. going the wrong way because I think that stuff is good for marketing because you're looking at the masses. Yes. You, you can't go down to the unique individual lead you, you, you have a pool of tam total addressable market and then what percentage of those are in market and can be captured within a window a bad a bad manager with artificial intelligence solutions at their fingertips will be the worst micromanager you've ever seen in your life in sales i, I, I hear it i hear the the ceo of one of those companies come up with this uh, correlation that he came up with yes. that if they had more than one person in the meeting, that deal was more likely to close. 
Well, that's just showing it's further along that more people are interested. That's right. You know, so you're like, okay, you don't know, you've never sold a deal in your life. You're the CEO of this company. You're coming up with this cause and effect correlation that has nothing to do with the cause and the correlation. Here's, here's what I think is going to happen. If, if you look at what social media has done to the human psyche in the last 10 years, where people say things on social media that they would never say to one another if they were sitting in the same room. And we see all kinds of bad behavior, people getting called out on crazy things and just this, it's, it's really a bad place to be. And I, I, hopefully we're learning from this. I'm starting to see some pushback. You see, Dave Chappelle just did a Netflix. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that or not, but uh, it's on he, my list, yeah. he pointed his finger at the audience and said, you guys are, are terrible. You're, you're calling people out on things that they did 20 years ago. And we're basically sick of it. So they're, they're trying to get back to a period of normalcy. And within sales, I think we might overmeasure salespeople for a period of time and then get back to this humanity that you're talking about to say, yeah. it's more than just the number of calls that you've made in the last week that, that that's going to distinguish you as an individual. And that's it. When I do talk to managers, you know, I say it's good to have activities. You have to get up at a certain time during the day. You have to be at the office. You have to work a certain number of hours. That's all good. Yeah. But when you make the number of calls be a target, you get that good heart's law. Yeah, absolutely. Where the, the, the it ceases to be, become a good measure once it becomes a public measure. People start yeah. to game it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen it so many times. Well, it's called gaming a compensation plan, right? We've all done it before. Uh, but I, I've seen it specific, specifically in sales where somebody will come up and say, we need at least a 3x pipeline. And in sales operations, we say, well, why 3X? Well, you want a 10X? I can get you a 10X. Well, how about yeah. 20X? Because right. if, if you tell salespeople that they have to have a certain ratio of, of opportunities to, to their target, they'll, they'll get that for you. And that, that's really what good, Goodhart's law is that says that when, once you make a, a measure public, then they start to game the system. They start to game it. Right. Because, yeah. because people are naturally going to go root of least resistance. That's the way we are. Uh, yeah, we only have so I, many... I wrote a comical story about it uh, when I was do, doing some research on this before I talked to you is they, they, they talked about, I can't remember where it was. I think it was in the United States where they had a rat problem and they, they, they put a bounty out on rats, but they noticed that the number of the, the population of rats was increasing, but they were collecting uh, rat tails as, as the, as the proof of killing a rat. So you, to, to, to get your bounty, you had to turn in a rat tail, but they found that the people bringing in the bounty were cutting the tails off the rats and then letting the rats go. So they'd go back and reproduce. So they'd have more rat tails to turn in to give more bounty. Right. So it's, 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 it's really the unintended consequences of, of any measure, right? Yeah. And how should a sales leader work around this? Well, I think quota is always going to be the most important measure of the productivity and performance of a salesperson. And there are, I mean, one of the reasons why I just joined the company where I am today is because I think they do a very balanced job of collecting information from across the enterprise and, and analyzing the true attributes of top performance. So you're looking at information from the, from the ERP system, from the CRM system, from any place that you can get your hands on, and you're getting a balanced view of what's really happening. So the, the idea is that quota is the best measure, but you have to do a better job at setting quota. Yeah. And if, if you can do a better job at that, then you can really distinguish your top performers from those that are not. And what is a good way of going about that setting there, quota? Well, so here, here's something that salespeople don't know is that there, there's an ideal distribution that most companies are looking for in terms of performance of their salespeople. The, the bell curve, they, they bell curve their salespeople. They expect 10 to 15% of the entire sales population to be their highest performers. Which th those would be the people that that price would have identified as as being in the square root of those individuals. They expect sixty five percent or more people to be at one hundred percent of their quota or greater, and then those people that don't achieve some certain minimum level of of threshold performance, let's say fifty percent of your quota, should be less than fifteen percent. Yeah. So th they're going to create a compensation scheme that's going to take money away from that bottom fifteen percent, reallocate it to the top fifteen percent. And then ensure that everybody within that 65% that are at their target incentive are earning 100% of their target incentive. There's math behind it. Yeah. Uh, and now, but how do you manage the reps day to day without micromanaging them? I think today we've taken micromanagement to the extreme 
because I talk to more reps than I do managers and yeah. they all say the same thing. It's like, if my manager got out of my way, I could sell something because not only it's activity, but it's the internal uh, BS of an enablement meetings, training, you know, it's all good, but it's like good on the list of what good compared to what? Well, I think if, if you're a top performer and you're, and you're making your, your quota and you're ab- above your year to date number, people are going to be less apt to look at those micro measures of, activity and calls and emails and things like that. So the best way to avoid that scrutiny is to be at your number. (laughs) Uh, Because those measures are not going to go away. Companies invest more money in a sales organization than any other organization inside the company. And and they, they, especially the CFO wants to know that they're getting their money's worth. Um, For a manager, like let's say that you've got somebody that's not making their quota they're probably doing everything that they need to do to get back, get themselves back on track. So those, those leading indicators, like, look, I mean, the, the amount of activity that you're involved in, the engagement that you have with your clients, the calls that you're making, the emails you're sending are a pretty decent indication of, of activity and at least that you're trying. So if you're not on your number, if you're not on your quota, make sure that you're at least showing activity that, that shows that you're trying to get to your number. And that gives your manager a lot more flexibility to, to save you, especially if you're new to a company and you're acclimating yourself, you need to have proof of effort at least. Well, and I think a proof of judgment that you know that you're working on the right things. Yeah. You know, because today you, you open up, I, I've seen the CRMs and the engagement tools and stuff and the to do's are in the hundreds. Now they're not all equal. Yes. Okay. Apply prices law to your opportunities. Okay, you got a hundred. Which ten of these are closable? And that—that's actually the place where artificial intelligence can really do a good job of helping you, because right. you know, salespeople—we all have our intuition, and we gravitate towards the ones that make us feel good, but they might not might not be the best ones. So j- just think: is artificial intelligence could be something to enhance your intuition? Like you've got a gut feel about this opportunity, and the AI will tell you, "You're right. This is a really good opportunity for you to go after." Or the AI might come back to you and tell you, don't go after this, but this is where the human spirit comes in. And you say, no. I'm going to trust my gut on this. I'm going to risk it. I'm going to go after it. So, And I think that is the right use of the technology. I think we were using it wrong. We didn't need a, a faster way to send spam. What we needed was a faster way to determine how to spend our time. Yes. You know, especially when you get a, a startup where you, somebody might have a third of the country or a fifth of the country. Where do I start? Absolutely. Yeah, here's a good place to start. Here's the high, the high, uh, high value targets that you could go after. I mean, I, I know when I, when I talk about AI, I sound a little bit down on it initially, but only because there's bad managers out there that are going to misuse it. Use it the wrong way. Yeah, but I, I think it's going to be a powerful enhancement to salespeople. It already is a powerful enhancement to salespeople. It's going to increase their intuition. And then it will also help managers really identify the attributes and, and things that salespeople should be working on to try to improve themselves. Yeah, it should give feedback. It should give focus, but not be on, in charge of the steering wheel. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I, I was a little bit hard on social media saying it's a terrible thing. Not all social media is a terrible thing. I personally love LinkedIn. I think yeah. it connects me with people like you who I never would have met. Right. Had we not had the opportunity to converse with one another through these things. And I think LinkedIn does a really good job of creating a community where people can share ideas and support one another. So it's, it's a positive use. And one other thing, the Hawthorne effect, what's your thoughts on that in sales? Yeah, the the Hawthorne effect was something that I I started to study a couple of years ago, because you notice that when people understand that they're being measured on something that they're, that they start to improve overall. And it was based upon some studies that General Electric did in one of their plants at the beginning of the 20th century, where they wanted to measure the effects of of changing lighting in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, manufacturing environment. So they, they kept changing the lights and they had a group of people observing what was happening to, to the individuals that, that were being affected by it. And they noticed no matter what they did, the, the productivity of the individuals improved. And it improved all the way up to the point where the individuals who were observing them left. And then once they left, their productivity went back to, to where it was before they were being observed, regardless of what the lighting was. So the, the idea is that when people know that they're being observed, that they, yeah. they perform better. So there's, it's not a bad thing. We, we know that when people are, are, are watching us, then, then we, we, do, we try harder. It's, it's the equivalent of stepping on a scale every day and, and watching what happens. And 
regulate. <laughs> like, okay, I, I probably need to get myself under control because I'm watching this and, and other people are watching it too. Well, I think from a management standpoint, you should be very careful what uh, you, you put that light on. Yes. I think too many are putting it on the dashboard today. And, Absolutely. And I think the dashboard is the wrong thing because everyone's just gaming it. So we have everyone playing office space instead of doing real sales. Yeah, in the end, you say, well, how, how are managers supposed to manage in these new environments? Well, accept the reality that quota is the, the ultimate measure, that there are activity measures out there that are going to get incorporated into, into what we all do. But you as a leader need to, in the end, have courage to stand behind those people you know are the best performers, to attract yes. those people to you and to your team, and then to stand behind them when they've got a down quarter or a down year or they're going through the natural human cycle of ups and downs. You, you got to be able to stand by those people. And that's it. Because I talk to reps and they, they hear, right. What I hear is that all oh, their managers slacking them. And even though they're in the cubicle next to them, right. It's like, there's no more of that communication. The ride along is kind of, you know, rare uh, where you can really understand how's that rep thinking? Why are they spending time on this deal? What is their strategy with this deal instead of the clicking? that the the process that thinking part of sales is trying to be marginalized by technology yeah so if you go and you look at a company that's had some tough quarters and maybe even a tough couple of years and look at the number of times that they fire their chief sales officer and maybe it's gone on for a span of four or five years it's 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 a play that's run by the ceo that yeah. the, the the company's not turning around they blame it on the cso and then they just keep rotating people into that office. And what they're really doing is a disservice to the stockholders because that chief sales officer never has the ability to get their feet under their grant, to get their, their footing under them and, and do the things that are necessary to turn that company around. And it takes years for that to happen. And it happens at, you know, because it slides down the hill, right? Because then it goes down to the rep. And I've seen one company, they had four people in Atlanta. Yeah. And I, and I jokingly one night, a kid at my uh, VP of sales goes, after the fifth one, do you think it might not be the rep? <laughs> 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 he didn't like that, but it was like, uh, <laughs> there might be an issue here. I'll give, a, I'll give a shout out to to one of the most admirable chief sales officers I've seen out there in my, in my career, uh, a company out of Boston called Akamai. I think people know it pretty well, right. but if you go and you research the history of that company, I, I spent a year with them back in the, in the mid 2000s. Their chief sales officer is a guy named Bob Hughes. And Bob was probably like one of the most tenured CSOs I've seen at any company. I, I can't remember exactly how long he spent there, but I know it was like 10 or 12 years. And th th I mean, there were a lot of ups and downs of that company as they, as they went from a hundred million dollar company to a multi-billion dollar company and Bob wrote it all. Yeah. And, and, you know, he, he stuck with it and the, the executive team there had confidence in him and he was a great part of making that company what it is today, the multi-billion dollar mega company that it is. So it, I think that proves the value of, of, of choosing your champion, standing behind your champion and, and, and helping them grow a company and, and sticking with them no matter what. There's That's a lot it, more value to that. Because I, I sense that the pendulum has gone from that type of leader who was probably a face-to-face, -face, get to know somebody, understand how they're selling, where the deal is, absolutely, all, all the way to the dashboard, whereas I don't care what you're thinking, doing, just uh, how many calls, how many face-to-face, -face, how many demos, how many proposals did you send? And, and I see that and I go, that's, you know, unless it's a transactional sale where you're the dominant player. I don't see it work. No, he knew his customers and how they like to be sold to. And he knew the salespeople would sell to them in those ways. And, and he stuck with his people and he stuck with his customers all the way through. And he said, trust my vision. And they did. And it paid off for them. Yeah, cool. uh, I, I think it's, it's a real tragedy when you fire your CSO every year. It's a really bad thing. It's, your, your company's not going to turn around doing that. That's it. They hire super fast. Yeah. You, you'll see them hire a CSO in three weeks and then give the guy nine months Yes. And all of a sudden, you know, and they, they know what's going on. And so they start put, pointing the finger and all of a sudden the implosion starts. Yeah. And you know, the, the other thing, too, is I, I noticed this just recently in a, in a company that I'm familiar with is that when you start to lose those people that price identified as being your top That's performers, if you lose a couple of those people for, for a company of 100 of 100 salespeople, you only need to lose 
let's say five of your of your top performers, you've just lost 25% of the productivity of the company in losing those five people. Yeah. And then the, the other five are the other 25%. So when, when you lose one of those people, it's not one person. Right. It, it's really multiple people if you convert it to a to a, uh, a full-time equivalent level. So you, you lose those 10 people, your company will, will, will spiral. And then anyone else that's paid on the, on the corporate number, let's say those engineers that are building your unbelievable product, they, they start missing out on their bonuses, they're gone too. So a company can spiral so unbelievably quickly. It does. It's and really I've fast. seen it happen, I'm seeing it happen now. Right, because it, you get the inverse result that you want. The good people leave, but the bad people stay. That's right. And, you know, your ability to continue attracting A players goes down. The reputation goes down. The recruiters know what's going on. They're not going to put the A players in there. They're going to walk the B players by there. And all of a sudden, it's a downward spiral. Yeah, I, I actually did a calculator for, for this thing because I'm a sales ops person and I like numbers. <laughs> but if, if you've got 100 salespeople, then, then, then 10 of those people are producing 50% of the results. For every one of those 10 people you lose, you're losing five people. Yeah. And for, for every one of the 90 that you're losing, you're losing 0.6. Yeah. So take care of your top performers. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much math and proof, yes. right? Hey, yeah. so the, for the people who are listening who want to follow you and connect with you, where should they do that? Uh, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Uh, I've got a pretty strong presence there and um, I'd love to talk to you, love to chat. I, I was on your, your podcast one other time and I got a great response from your audience. So you've got a good thing going and thanks for, for uh, inviting me to come back. It's really been a pleasure. Because when we talk about math and sales, what do we do? We focus on the quantity, the number of calls, demos, presentations, proposals, but these are not really accomplishments. Uh, they can be gamed very easily, and they are gamed. So everyone's playing office space, and no one's believing it. Uh, managers are denial, but even though they're gaming their manager, let's just face it. And I, I've been everywhere from the rep all the way up to the uh, on the board. And what you see is a lot of phoniness and gaming instead of honesty and quality. That's what we have to do as leaders. And the best leaders I've ever known wanted to talk with salespeople, understand where they are, help them understand where the deal is and how to move it forward. This is what I love about the courses. I get to hear reps out. And usually by them talking through the deal, they see the pieces that they're missing. They're facing the things that they should have been facing sooner so that they can now take action and either prevent the deal from going south or ensure the deal is going to go and close. And I think this is one of these episodes where you just have to send it to your manager anonymously because the number one thing I hear from reps today is they're, they're getting buried in mindless activity because today we've got all this data. And if you have 200 reminders a day, how do you know which ones count? We only get comped on the things that close. So why should we work on the things that don't close? People have drank the Kool-Aid of endless hard work, assuming that it creates accomplishment. It doesn't necessarily do that. If it did, everybody at Walmart and Starbucks would be rich. No, they're barely making minimum wage. Why? Because there's more to life than hard work. There's smart work, being at the right place in the right time, knowing what to work on in what order to work on it. That judgment, that uh, instinct, the way you do it, how you perform. Now, if you asked a comedian, you know, how many sets did you do? That's a good element. You have to do it. You have to practice. But just doing it twice as much is not going to give you twice the results. You have to become better. And what do they do? Getting their feedback, being open to taking feedback. That's the part that we have to own. We have to change our thinking so that it, we feel like getting feedback. Now, I'm going to be doing a lot of work on this about how to condition our mammal brain, because we, we try and 
use logic with our mammal brain. And it works temporarily. But our mammal brain is much more like a muscle, meaning that it's habit forming. You can't go to the gym once and get a good set of guns or quads. You have to go three, four times a week for about a year before, you know, you really got it. Maybe three to six months if you got muscle memory. But our subconscious mind, our mammal brain is much like that. It's a habit-forming brain. Once the habit's there, it, they just need to be reinforced, much like going to the gym or practicing anything. But it it does dissipate. It does uh, depreciate. Hey, so update on the courses. Uh what, we, what I've been doing is moving to a case study-based model on the office hours. So I still do the Q&A. I open it up, let people ask questions. I go through a couple of case studies that I heard in the week before uh, the office hours and the one-on-ones. I, I give you a, a brief synopsis of the one-on-ones and go through the case study and apply the course to it. People are having enormous success getting meetings, starting conversations, and closing the complex sale. This is our job. If you're not in the course yet, go to b2brevenue.com, and you'll go to training and then schedule a time to talk. And I'll look up your information on LinkedIn so you don't have to give me a life story. Just tell me what you want to accomplish. What's going to double your income? And here, guess how much you're going to save on the course. Take your income Take 500K minus your income. That's how much you're going to make. That's how much the course is going to make you. If you apply it, if you practice, and you get a year-long access to the material, you get unlimited 30-minute coaching one-on-ones with me over Zoom, uh, you get immediate access to all the content with each person who joins the course. It has a network effect. Get more questions, more case studies, and you get more content to apply. And it, this is the crucial skills. And what you're going to learn is that it is a performance. And you get to see the difference between the A's and the B's. You get to leave and have a deliverable of your system. No longer just this magical email or statement or questions. We get to develop this. Take your game to the next level. If you're in sales... You want to become one of those price salespeople, one of the square root. You don't want to be the B and C players. I'll tell you, this is what managers, every manager does this. Okay, they're going to squash the A's by giving their territory to the B's. The B's are going to screw it up anyway, and they're not going to make their number. But they, they, they stay around, and they do okay. That's fine. No problem with that. C's, they fire. Okay, so <laughs> it's been this way forever. Um you know, it varies company to company. But what you want to do is be the A's. Be the A's to the point where everybody wants you, where you have the leverage, where the company would do anything to keep you. And that's what the course does. B2Brevenue.com. Check it out. Make sure you're checking out the other podcasts, Sales Questions, Brutally Honest Answers, and the B2B Revenue Leadership Show. Check out the videos on YouTube. Maverick Method on YouTube. Check it out there. Subscribe. I got funny videos coming out twice a week, Monday and Wednesday typically. Uh, let me know any topics, anything I can do to help you. Send me an in-mail either on LinkedIn or uh, directly. We'll see you next time.